Usually, when we think of postcards, we think of scenic photos that we can send to friends and family from the places we visit, or that they can send to us to show us where they've been. But postcards from the past have sometimes been much more than that. What tales can these old postcards tell? This one shows telescopes at the top of Steamboat Rock in Garden of the Gods. And this one of Bennett Avenue in Cripple Creek is made of leather. And this one claims to be of a Rocky Mountain canary? But as Caitlin is about to discover, sometimes you can stumble across something even stranger. Hi. Hi. Can I help you? Yeah, I stumbled across um, on the PPLD website, the Photo Digital Archives, and then I found some postcards. I was wondering if you actually had some that I could look at here. We do, we do. Um, but before we do that, I'm just going to have you lock up your purse, uh, your book, your beverage, and also that highlighter. Why? Uh, we're a little different at Special Collections. We don't check out any items, and the items that we do have are historic materials. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give you a locker key for number six. And okay. what's your first name? Caitlin. Caitlin. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, before we start, I'm going to have you fill out this researcher registration form. Okay. I just need you to put in your library card or your driver's license, okay? Okay, so here are the postcards. I'm going to have you wear these white cotton gloves. Okay. Um, they protect the materials. Postcards start here and they're arranged by subject. Okay, okay. so let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks. So I found this postcard and it seems a little strange to me. Frozen to death on Pikes Peak in the August. Yeah. Um, seems like it might not be real. Can you tell me more about it? Um, tell you what, let's do a little more research, okay? okay. So this postcard actually reminds me of another bizarre story on Pikes Peak. I pulled the Rocky Mountain News from 1876. This is on microfilm. And the story is called Rodents on the Rampage, an awful and almost incredible story, a fight for life with rats on Pikes Peak. An infant child eaten up. Oh my gosh, that sounds horrible. Yeah. Stories of giant mountain rats, some the size of cats, began with this story in 1876. The number of rats inhabiting the rocky crevices and cavernous passages at the summit of Pikes Peak has recently become formidable and dangerous. These animals are known to feed upon a saccharine gum that percolates through the pores of the rocks, apparently upheaved by some volcanic action. Since the establishment of the government signal station on the summit of the peak, these animals have acquired a voracious appetite for raw and uncooked meat, the scent of which seems to impart to them a ferocity rivaling the fierceness of the starved Siberian wolf. The most singular trait in the character of these animals is that they are never seen in the daytime. When the moon pours down her queenly light upon the summit, they may be seen in countless numbers trooping around among the rocky boulders that crown the barren waste. The article goes on to tell of the post Mr. John T. O'Keefe took at the signal station on Pikes Peak and the terrible events that befell him the evening of his arrival. Soon after dark, while Mr. O'Keefe was engaged in the office forwarding night dispatches to Denver and Washington, he was startled by a loud scream from Mrs. O'Keefe, who had retired for the night to an adjoining bedroom, and who came rushing into the office screaming, The rats! The rats! Mr. O'Keefe, with great presence of mind, immediately drew around his wife a scroll zinc plating. As the story unfolds, the O'Keefe's battle off the rats finally killing them with an electric wire and a battery valve, which shocked the remaining rats to death. The saddest part of the night adventure, though, says the article, was that the rats had destroyed their infant child, leaving nothing but its skull. A grave marker was placed on the top of Pike's Peak for the infant, which read, erected in memory of Erin O'Keefe, daughter of John and Nora O'Keefe, who was eaten by mountain rats in the year 1876. This horrifying tale led to further stories of these gruesome creatures until the 1920s when they were said to have finally died off. It was later revealed that John O'Keefe 
and the Pueblo chieftain reporter who ran the initial article had completely fabricated the tale. As it turns out, O'Keefe never even had a child. So that story wasn't real at all? No, the story was fake. The grave marker was real, but it was the burial site of a pet burrow. Oh, wow. And so tourists were charged 50 cents for photographs at the site. Wow. Mm -hmm. So does that mean this postcard was a fake? Not necessarily. The postcard could be real. It also could be an example of sensationalist journalism, mm -hmm. like, you know, the rat story. Or it could be a reenactment. This actually reminds me of the Grant Crumley murder trial. Um, they used reenactments um, of the murder scene. Oh wow, that sounds really interesting. I'd like to hear more about that. Okay. The murder trial of Sam Strong by Grant Crumley was big news in Cripple Creek in 1901. The Colorado Springs Gazette ran the following description of the murder on August 23rd, 1901. J. Grant Crumley this morning at 5.50 o'clock shot and killed Sam Strong the well-known mine owner in the Newport Saloon on Bennett Avenue. A charge of number four buckshot struck Mr. Strong in the right temple. This article goes on to tell how Strong, his father-in-law, and a couple of acquaintances were visiting the Newport Saloon in Cripple Creek when a fight broke out between Crumley and Strong. Strong pulled his gun out, and fearing that his life was in danger, Crumley dodged behind the bar and picked up a shotgun of the kind with a sawed-off barrel turned it on the mine owner and fired. These photos, which are part of PPLD's special collections, were used as evidence in the murder trial of Grant Crumley. In this photo, you see the supposed body of Crumley lying on the saloon floor. But in this one, the corpse appears perfectly alive, standing behind the bar. This is also interesting, but how are we gonna find out if this postcard was real or fake like the other stories you've told me about? Well, first we need to find out where the postcard came from and see if there are any clues. Okay. So these are some items that came in with the postcard. Um, they were donated. The donor found them at an estate sale. And it's mainly, you know, photographs and a few newspapers. How are these connected to the postcard? Um, they don't appear to be directly connected. They're mainly portraits and this newspaper is mainly recipes. What's the next step? Well, we can determine if the postcard actually was made in 1911, like it says. There are a couple things that we can do to find that out. Um, but I would really suggest now to start a research log. It's just a way to organize your work and make sure you're not duplicating any research. That sounds great. Okay. According to these books, this postcard would have been manufactured in between January 1910 and July 1918. How do we know that? Well, you'll see it's a divided back postcard with an area for correspondence and name and address. And then there's an AZO stamp box in the corner with triangles pointing upwards. So this postcard stock is contemporary with the August 1911 event. Well, that's a good sign, but couldn't the postcard still be from a staged photo? I mean, look at all the snow. Could there really be snow like that in August in Colorado? Well, let's check out the weather reports from 1911 and find out. Okay. So to figure out if there was snow on Pikes Peak in August of 1911, I pulled the climatological data from our stacks upstairs. Unfortunately, we don't have the 1911 volume, but I was able to look um, at, at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's library site, and I pulled this weather report from 1911. It does measure snowfall but it doesn't record snowfall for the months of June through August. However, it does mention colder temperatures in the Rocky Mountain West during the month. So. so it's possible that it did snow. It's possible. And what we can do next is take a look at the microfilm of the local newspaper, see if there are any reports of the two deaths occurring on Pikes Peak. Sounds good. Okay, so it turns out the deaths were actually reported in the Gazette. Here's an article from August 23rd, 1911. The headline is, Die on Peak in Sight of Summit. Middle-aged couples succumb to cold and exhaustion after mountain climb. Within half a mile of their goal, the summit of the peak, which they essayed to conquer on foot, Mr. and Mrs. Willis A. Skinner, each aged about 50 years, of Dallas, Texas, were overcome by cold and exhaustion and were frozen to death. 
Their bodies, half buried under a foot of snow, were found close to the Cog Road track on Pikes Peak about two o'clock yesterday afternoon by Z.C. Croy, who was walking down from the mountain top. Croy, who is 21 years old, was alone when he saw a part of Mrs. Skinner's blue cotton skirt fluttering in the breeze. He looked closer and was able to distinguish the body of a man and a woman lying side by side and almost covered with snow. He hurried on down the road and half a mile below met S.A. Rainus and Harry H. Hoddles, young men from Denver who were walking to the summit. Croy told of finding the bodies and asked Rainus and Hoddles to notify Cog Road officials as soon as they reached the top of the mountain. He later said that he was so confused when he discovered the bodies that he did not think to return and notify the Cog Road officials at the summit. Mrs. Skinner lay face downward, her hands crossed before her face. Skinner was lying upon his back, one hand touching the body of his wife. Both were frozen stiff. Mr. and Mrs. Skinner were evidently unused to the sudden changes in mountain climate and were thinly attired. Neither wore outer wraps of any kind and both had straw hats. The woman's dress was of the thinnest material, as were her undergarments. Skinner's coat was of a black alpaca, a garment popular in warm localities. Skinner and his wife were seen by men employed along the Cog Road at various points along the trail Monday afternoon. Skinner was apparently greatly affected by the effort of walking up the mountain, and on several occasions told his wife that he did not believe he could get to the summit. Those who heard the couple discuss the advisability of trying to reach the top say that Mrs. Skinner was eager to push ahead, saying that she had come all the way from Texas to walk up the peak. At Windy Point, a little more than two miles below the summit, Skinner was almost in a state of collapse, and his wife was walking several yards ahead of him. This was about four o'clock Monday afternoon. Mr. and Mrs. Skinner staggered up on the mountain for more than a mile, and then, with their goal in sight, they sank down, unable to take another step. Then it was that a snowstorm broke, which drenched the foothills and lowlands with rain, and snow transformed the miles of mountain and sky into a wilderness of white. Wow, so the deaths were real, which is a great sign. But isn't this the same paper that published the rat story hoax? I'm not sure I believe it. Well, you're right. We know from the Aaron O'Keefe rat story that not everything in print can be trusted. So we should really find out if these people existed. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to look at the Federal Census and Ancestry Library Edition, which is available on all PPLD computers. Okay, sounds good. The Federal Census of the United States has been taken every 10 years since 1790. The latest census on which the Skinners would have been enumerated was 1910. Based on the newspaper account, Willis and Sally Skinner were printers from Dallas, Texas. When the census is taken, the enumerator asks a lot of questions and records the information on a form. On the 1910 census, you will find the street and address, names of the people in the household, the relationship of each person to the head of the household, gender, race, age, marital status, and number of years married. You also will find the place where each person listed was born, where their parents were born, the language they speak, and what they do for a living. So let's see if we can find a census record for Willis Skinner. Okay. Okay, so we're going to go to Ancestry and we're going to go to the U.S. Census Collection. And we'll scroll down to 1910. And we'll see if there's a Willis Skinner living in Texas. Hmm. No Willis Skinner is in Dallas, Texas. So let's edit our search and I'm actually going to put in Sally Skinner. And here's a Sally Skinner living in Dallas with Willis A. Skinner. Let's look at the original image. Scroll down. Looks like Willis is born in North Carolina. He's a printer. And whenever you have um, a record at the bottom of the page, it's important to go on to the next page, okay. just to make sure you're not missing more family members. And it looks like they have a boarder and a servant living with them as well. So the census proves that the couple in the Gazette story really existed. If the people in the events were real, then the photo is real too, right? Not necessarily. What we should do next is look at the Dallas newspaper 
Um, because remember, we want to make sure this wasn't just a hoax reported on by local journalists. Like the rat story. Exactly. Okay. So here are some articles in the Dallas Morning News that appear to be about the Skinners. The first one is from August 23rd, 1911, and the headline reads, Dallas couple freeze to death in Colorado. The article in the Dallas Morning News goes on to describe the scene in much the same way as the Colorado Springs Gazette article did, but future articles shined additional information on their deaths. This article from August 22nd titled, Hope You Don't Freeze, is particularly haunting. A pathetic feature of the deaths of the Skinners is the finding of a letter in Skinner's pocket dated Dallas, August 17th from J.H. Choice, in which these words occur. I hope you are having the time of your life in Colorado. I'm sending you an overcoat as per your request. I hope you don't freeze to death on Pikes Peak. In the Colorado Springs Gazette article from August 23rd, 1911, it also talked of the items found with the Skinner's bodies, adding these to the list. In Skinner's pocketbook was found a $10 bill, water soaked and frozen, and about a dollar in small change. There were also two accident insurance policies for $2,500 each, one in the name of Sally E. Skinner and the other in Skinner's name. They were dated August 9, 1911 by the company issuing them, the Standard Accident Insurance Company of Detroit, and marked good for 30 days. A conditionary clause, among others, stated that premiums would not be paid where death was due from overexertion. Wow, that note is really strange. And those other items found in his pockets? Do you think we can call the insurance company to see if they really took out those policies? Sure, that's a good idea. While you do that, I will look for more articles. So I'm really frustrated I couldn't get a hold of anyone at the insurance company. I feel like I've really hit a dead end. Sometimes that happens. Researchers hit dead ends from time to time. Hang in there. The good news is I did find some more articles on the Skinners. Great. August 23rd, 1911. Willis A. Skinner and wife, who were frozen to death in Colorado, had been residents of Dallas for about 25 years. They both worked as printers on the Dallas News and the Galveston News about 14 years ago. Mr. Skinner was once in the job printing business in Dallas and had worked for many of the local printing establishments. He was about 55 years of age and is survived by a nephew, Paul Skinner, and son, 12 years of age. August 24th, 1911. The bodies of Mr. and Mrs. W.A. Skinner, who froze to death on Pikes Peak Tuesday, will reach Dallas tomorrow morning. Mr. Skinner was a native of North Carolina. He came to Texas about 35 years ago. Mrs. Skinner was a native of Mount Pleasant, Texas. They were married the year after Mr. Skinner came to the state. They retired from work about 10 years ago and let their membership in the typographical union lapse. They had no children. August 26, 1911. The funeral will take place Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock from the residence to Oakland Cemetery. A Denver newspaper in an account of the tragic death of the couple on Pikes Peak tells of the heroic actions of Mrs. Skinner, who when her husband fell overcome by the cold and was unable to go on, assisted him to a sheltered ledge of rock, and rather than try to save her own life by deserting her husband while she had strength, sat down beside him until death came to her also. She was found frozen to death in a sitting posture by the side of her husband. August 28, 1911. In a double funeral, which was very largely attended yesterday afternoon at two o'clock, the bodies of Willis A. Skinner and Sally E. Skinner, his wife, were buried in Oakland Cemetery. The two were buried as they had died, side by side. That is a lot of conflicting information. What can we believe? It is confusing. Didn't you think it was weird that one article mentioned the Skinners having a child and the other said that they didn't have any children? Yeah, that is really weird. And one of the articles said the body was found in a sitting position, when in the postcard it doesn't look like that at all. Hmm. First, let's sort out whether or not the Skinners had any children, and then we'll investigate the position of the body. How are we going to do that? Well, do you remember in the 1910 census a son being mentioned? Mm -hmm. See Frank Skinner, 11 years old. Let's see if we can go back even further. Okay. So here's the 1900 U.S. Census. Okay. Um, it lists Carnegie Frank Skinner as an adopted son of Willis and Sally. Um, he's born in March of 1899 in Texas. 
Also listed in the household is a boarder from Georgia and a 35-year-old widowed servant born in Louisiana. You can see that Carnegie Frank Skinner was born in Texas but had a mother born in Louisiana. So this is just pure speculation, but I believe that Emma Conway, the 35-year-old servant, was Carnegie Frank Skinner's birth mother. That's interesting. Um, I wonder what happened to Carnegie Frank Skinner. Well, let's see if we can find any articles about him. Okay. Um, you check the microfilm and I'll check the database articles. Sounds good. <laughs> Hey, I found something on Carnegie Frank Skinner. As if losing his parents wasn't bad enough, it looks like he was also fighting his relatives for his parents' estate. Oh, interesting. Nice work. Colorado Springs Gazette, September 20th, 1913. For the last two days, Benjamin Chilton, a Dallas attorney, has been in Colorado Springs in the interests of his client, an adopted son of Mr. and Mrs. Skinner, who seeks an estate estimated at nearly $100,000 which was left by his foster parents. It is understood that the young man was not legally adopted, although looked upon as the prospective heir of the aged couple. Plaintiffs in the suit, the relatives of Mrs. Skinner, are represented by Judge Wood, also of Dallas. Several depositions have been taken of those who first saw the bodies, including statements by Coroner Jackson, a photographer, and a Gazette reporter who went up the peak on a special train at the time the man and the woman were found. The depositions deal particularly with an attempt to prove by witnesses which of the two died first, as upon this point apparently hinges the claims of the adopted son. Well, I found something interesting as well. Check out this article from September 23, 1913 in the Dallas Morning News. Big fortune hinges on Dallas lawsuit. The Dallas Morning News, Tuesday, September 23, 1913. The Skinners left an estate of $100,000. The plaintiffs in the suit, the heirs of Mrs. Skinner, are represented by Attorney Wood. Several depositions have been taken of those who first saw the bodies of Mr. and Mrs. Skinner, including a statement of Coroner Jackson, a newspaper photographer, and reporters who went up the peak in a special train when the man and woman were found. The depositions deal particularly with an attempt to prove which of the two died first as on this point apparently hinged the claims of the adopted son. It is understood that both Mr. and Mrs. Skinner left a will in which it was provided that if Mrs. Skinner died first, the property was to go to the young man. But if Mr. Skinner died first, the property would be divided among other heirs. It sounds like this could have turned into quite the legal battle. I wonder what happened. How did they determine if Sally or Willis Skinner died first? And I wonder if their son, Carnegie Frank Skinner, got the family fortune. Well, we could find out. Seriously, how? Through the library's legal database, Westlaw. So Westlaw is a legal database available here in Special Collections and at Penrose Library. Okay. So from the PPLD homepage, go to research, then down to Law and Legal Resources, and then select Westlaw. It's not the easiest database to use, but I'll show you some tips to make it easier. First, click on the Colorado tab, and then we'll select a database. Even though we're in the Colorado section, we can search all federal and state cases. Click that box. Now, type in a word that would relate to the court case we're looking for. For our research, we'll search Skinner. Remember, there was a court battle over the Skinner's estate, so we may find something. Unfortunately, by searching with just Skinner, we get 10,000 results. Let's narrow that down by clicking the Edit Search button. We're back at the search screen, so let's look at the advanced options. We have an idea when the court case would have occurred, so we can narrow our results by adding years. We know that the case would have taken place after 1911 and probably before 1925, so let's put that into the search and see how we do. So that reduced the number of results down to 2,268. That's still a lot. That really is a lot. Is there anything else we can do? I don't have time to sift through all of those court cases. Well, we can edit the search a little bit more. The Skinners died in Colorado, so we'll add that to the search, since that would likely have been reported in the case transcript, which is what this is searching. Use the ampersand to add the term. Now we have 104 results. I want to narrow it down a little more. So we will add the name Willis. Now we're down to two results. 
So this first one looks promising. It's uh, Fitzgerald versus Ayers. And we'll click on the case link. And here we have a transcript of the case and the findings. Great. As matters of fact, the court found that on August 21, 1911, Willis A. Skinner and his wife, Sally E. Skinner, died in a snowstorm on Pikes Peak in Colorado, and that the evidence introduced in the case was not sufficient to show which one died first. As a matter of law, the court concluded, as far as we need state, that as it was unascertainable from the evidence which one, if either of the testators, Willis A. Skinner or Sally E. Skinner, survived the other, their property rights are to be disposed of and adjudged as if death occurred to both at the same time. That the failure of proof as to which of the two testators, if either survived the other, brings into operation items two of the wills and items three of the codicils, respectively. And under the said wills and codicils of each testator, all the property of each was devised to and vested in the defendant Carnegie Frank Skinner. The court transcript shows there was insufficient evidence to determine whether Willis or Sally Skinner died first. It was ruled that Carnegie Frank Skinner, their adopted son, was heir to the fortune. But for our purposes, the transcript gives us evidence about the authenticity of the postcard. The dead bodies of Mr. and Mrs. Skinner were found about a half mile from the summit of Pikes Peak. They were lying almost side by side, and there was snow on the ground. The body of Mr. Skinner was lying on its back, almost touching that of his wife, with one arm in a folded position across his chest, and the other arm and hand lying partly across his body. He had on a light alpaca coat, and the sleeves of both his coat and shirt were pushed back from his wrist. The body of Mrs. Skinner was lying face downward, with her arms under her face. There is testimony to the effect that Mr. Skinner appeared to be about 60 years of age and a light, frail man, that Mrs. Skinner was rather robust and the stronger and heavier of the two. There were no tracks in the snow where the bodies were found. That description of the scene is exactly what is depicted on the postcard. Yes, in fact, they used the postcard as photo evidence in the court case. So what do you think? Does this postcard really show Willis and Sally Skinner frozen to death on Pikes Peak? Given all of the evidence, yes, I think it really does. Case closed. It's really amazing how much information we found from one postcard. But I think I'm going to go up to Pikes Peak on my own to see if I can find the site. That sounds cool. Well, remember the items in your locker before you go. Thank you so much for all your help. And don't forget to check the weather report before you go. 